I'm just going to do those two cases. Dog All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I hope you're enjoying the burritos. <laughs> you may not know this, but I, I do have an MBA. I'm a master burrito ambassador at, at Chipotle. It's a true story. I can show you my diploma. My name is Neil Siegel. I co-direct uh, the program in public law here at Duke Law School. And today's subject uh, is important decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court during the October 2012 term in the criminal area. And I have with me an abundance of talent and experience in the criminal area, uh, both on the prosecution side as well as on uh, the defense side. So Lisa Griffin, to uh, my uh, right, is uh, uh, the guru on our faculty in the areas of evidence and constitutional criminal procedure. She also teaches and writes uh, in the area of federal criminal justice policy. More generally, she's going to be talking about uh, a couple of Fourth Amendment dog sniff cases, as well as an important Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination case. Uh, to Professor Griffin's right, Professor Sam Buell, uh, who teaches and writes, among uh, other things, in the areas of criminal law, federal criminal law, and corporate crime, will be talking about some sentencing decisions from the past term. And then uh, to Professor Buell's right, Professor Jim Coleman will be talking about uh, another Sixth Amendment uh, right uh, to effective assistance of counsel, an important case in that area. Professor Coleman teaches criminal law, uh, capital punishment, wrongful convictions. He also co-directs Duke Law School's renowned uh, wrongful convictions clinic. It was just featured on NPR, and I was treated to it in the middle of uh, the day. He also co-directs our appellate litigation clinic. Uh, so without uh, further ado, let's begin with uh, Professor Griffin, and we're going to proceed in procedural order from the fourth to the fifth to the sixth amendments. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm actually going to flip that just slightly by talking about the fifth amendment first. Um, That's okay. We don't even need to amend the Constitution. <laughs> and the reason for doing that is actually to point out that very often cases that seem insignificant and fall under the radar and, and purport to deal with things that have already been largely decided are important and have implications for future decisions and decisions that are getting lots of attention and um, seem poised to decide very important pending issues that um, will affect cases for years to come can um, have incredibly simple outcomes and be very minimalist in terms of uh, the impact that they have. So I flipped it because I actually think that what the court is doing with respect to the Fifth Amendment um, is significantly more important than the Fourth Amendment decisions concerning dogs. Um, so starting with the Fifth Amendment, um, one of just about every term since the Miranda decision, the Supreme Court has had to confront how far Fifth Amendment protections extend when it comes to the silence of suspects in investigations. And increasingly, the court is commenting explicitly on something that has been apparent from its jurisprudence for a long time, which is that there is no such thing as a right to silence and that there is no such thing as silence itself. Um, it's commonly understood that the Fifth Amendment protects a right to silence, but um, as Justice Alito reminds us in the Salinas versus Texas decision, that is not the case. Neither textually nor practically is there a protection for the right to silence in the Fifth Amendment. What the Fifth Amendment protects against is compelled testimonial self-incrimination. And the Salinas versus Texas case is a useful illustration of that. Uh, it concerns a 1992 double homicide in Houston, and eventually, the investigation into this homicide focused on an individual named Genovivo Salinas. And he agreed uh, to meet with police um, at the station house and answer their questions about the case. Because that meeting was voluntary and Mr. Salinas was not in custody in the course of it, he was never given his Miranda warnings. The common understanding that there is a right to remain silent comes from the Miranda warnings, which of course begin, you have the right to remain silent. But the only reason for that is because Miranda assumes that the context of being in custody and being interrogated is compulsion. Absent that context, there's no such thing as a right to silence. And of course, Mr. Salinas is there voluntarily. Um, he is questioned for nearly an hour and is responsive to all of the questions that law enforcement ask him until he is asked whether a shotgun that law enforcement retrieved from the house that Mr. Salinas shares with his parents um, will have shells that match the casings found at the crime scene. 
Now he falls silent. And one of the officers questioning him later testified that in response to that question, in addition to falling silent, he looked down, shuffled his feet, bit his bottom lip, and clenched his hands and generally appeared to tighten up. They moved on from that, and he went on to answer subsequent questions. And that encounter left the court itself with a question, which is, what use can prosecutors now make of the silence um, that Salinas exhibited in response to that one question. And this is an issue on which circuit courts um, have reached conflicting decisions. As I did, that no one can comment on it. Because if you are told by police that you have the right to remain silent, and then you do so, not much can be inferred from that decision. Um, it's also true since the Griffin decision in 1965 that Mr. Salinas's failure to take the stand in his own defense, and he didn't testify at his trial, cannot be commented on by prosecutors. But the conundrum is, well, what about someone who hasn't received Miranda warnings and isn't testifying in court, but is having a voluntary encounter with law enforcement and falls silent in the course of questioning? Um, and that's been the difficult question. And it can be really important evidence. Uh, Mr. Salinas was tried twice, and his first trial ended in a hung jury. And at his second trial, the prosecutor, though he had raised this issue of the silence at the first trial, he didn't argue much from it. At the second trial, he made a big point of arguing that any innocent person confronted with such a question would respond um, and explain about the gun. Um, so this brings the court uh, to the point of having to address this conflict, and they served up a totally incoherent response. Um, there is no line of reasoning that commands a majority. Justice Alito wrote the controlling opinion, and it holds that witnesses who want to stay silent have to speak out loud and say so. Um, that's not the first time that we've encountered that. That is in the Burgess case and many earlier cases. But it was partly a way for Justice Alito um, in what you know, became the controlling opinion um, to avoid the central question and to hold that there's no Fifth Amendment claim at all because Mr. Salinas um, didn't invoke his right to silence. Justice Thomas wrote separately um, and was joined by Justice Scalia, and he wanted to answer the broader question about what use prosecutors can make of such statements. And according to his reasoning, commenting on someone's silence is not the same thing as compelling testimony, and therefore there wouldn't have been a violation even if Mr. Salinas had invoked his right. The really interesting opinion, in my view, is Justice Breyer's dissent. Um, he was joined by Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. And he takes note of a concept that the court has not previously noted that I have um, found, many, found really interesting in other contexts and noticed in a lot of lower court decisions, um, which is that innocent people are also protected by preserving some space around silence. Um, according to Justice Breyer, suspects, even innocent ones, are in a predicament because if they stay silent, that, of course, connotes consciousness of guilt. If they speak, they might reveal some unrelated prejudicial fact. Um, accordingly, Justice Breyer would have found Salinas' silence sufficient to invoke the privilege, and he would have found the privilege sufficient to protect the silence itself from comment. Um, so the opinion is really interesting in acknowledging the possibility of interrogated innocence, um, and also in accounting for the point we've arrived at, which is that there is no such thing as silence itself. Um, and Justice Breyer advocates examining all of the circumstances of individual encounters with law enforcement to try to discern whether there's been an attempt to claim the privilege. Um, so the point here, I think, is that these Fifth Amendment decisions, and there, there truly have been at least one every term um, since Miranda, a lot of them have been pretty low in terms of being off the radar. The big blockbuster one is the 2000 Dickerson decision in which the court declined to overturn Miranda itself. But almost every other decision the court has issued has made it increasingly clear that Miranda's scope is very, very narrow. Um, and if you want to stay silent, you have to speak first. You don't have any right to silence per se. And if you are silent, in many contexts, that can be treated as an admission or consciousness of guilt. So the right itself is getting constricted a lot. Um, I just want to have just a couple minutes to comment on the Fourth Amendment cases um, that 
um, I agreed to mention, but I ended up, although I've spoken about them repeatedly, before they were decided, finding them entirely uninteresting in, in terms of the decision itself, um, because they don't really tell us anything new. And this, those are the cases people were paying attention to. Everyone loves a dog, and um, they're, they're easily accessible. They got a lot of media attention. Um, but ultimately, the high hopes that they were going to tell us things like what constitutes a search in a way that would carry over into the context of advanced uses of technology, or what the you know where the boundaries are ultimately going to be drawn, whether they truly lie at the front door of the home, um, whether there might be some sort of sliding scale for probable cause that would permit lesser intrusions on, on lesser suspicion, all of those questions remain unanswered. Um, so there are two dog sniff cases. In the first one, um, Justice Scalia writes for the court in the Florida versus Hardina's case, which involves the straightforward question of whether you can bring a drug sniffing dog to the front door of a home and whether it con constitutes a search when you do so. Um, and Justice Scalia adhered very strongly to the property rights theory of the Fourth Amendment that he has been advancing in a lot of recent cases, including the well-known Jones decision on GPS. Um, and in his view, even though the public and police can approach a front door, and that's not a trespass. Um, dogs can't um, because it's an intrusion that, in his view, would have been a trespass at common law. Um, Justices Kagan, Ginsburg, and Sotomayor concurred but made a point of explaining that it would also violate a reasonable expectation of privacy just as looking through someone's window with binoculars might. And then there is um, a not unexpected Justice Alito dissent joined by the Chief Justice, um, Justice Kennedy and Justice Breyer, calling out uh, Justice Scalia um, for the second time in a couple of years on his uh, common law um, history um, and concluding that since dogs have been domesticated for 12,000 years, um, it probably wasn't a trespass at common law or at the time that the Fourth Amendment was drafted um, for dogs to approach a front door along with um, a human handler. Uh, moreover, the, um, that dissent would have found that there's no reasonable expectation of privacy violated either because odors waft um, including into public spaces, and there isn't any expectation of privacy in them. Um, I'm going to stop there Okay. and let you take over. All right, so I'll talk about, uh, there were a number of important Fourth Amendment decisions, right? decisions concerning the language in the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. I think the most important was Maryland against King, a uh, 5-4 decision that involved uh, the constitutionality of um, collecting and analyzing a DNA sample from persons who are arrested but not yet convicted on felony charges. So the case involves uh, Alonzo King. Uh, he's arrested in 2009 on first and second degree assault charges, and he's processed through a facility in Maryland, uh, Wicomico County, Maryland. Anyone from Wicomico County? Yeah, well, uh, those are the facts. Uh, booking personnel used a cheek swab at this facility to take a DNA sample, and that was pursuant to Maryland law, the Maryland DNA Collection Act. And then that swab was matched to a different crime, an unsolved 2003 rape, and King was charged with the rape. Uh, King uh, moves to suppress uh, the DNA match, arguing that this state law violates the U.S. Constitution, violates the Fourth Amendment. The trial court upholds uh, the state law, and King is convicted of rape, but the Maryland Court of Appeals, the highest court in Maryland, sets aside the conviction. Uh, it invalidates the parts of the law that authorizes DNA collection from felony arrestees. So what does the U.S. Supreme Court do? Well, as I mentioned, it fractures uh, five uh, to four, not, uh, uh, not uh, exactly in the typical 5-4 ideological way. Uh, there's an important switch here, as well as in one of the dog cases, between uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer. So you've got this ideological fracture, except Breyer and Scalia are changing places. Uh, the court holds that when officers make an arrest supported by probable cause uh, to hold for a serious crime, and they bring the suspect to the station, uh, and detain him or her in custody, then taking and analyzing a cheek swab, swab of, the DNA, of the arrestee's DNA is like fingerprinting and photographing a legitimate police booking procedure. 
that is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. And so the court, in an opinion by Justice Kennedy, joined by the Chief Justice Thomas, Justice Breyer, and Justice Alito, upholds this practice, at least as applied to felony arrestees. And the really interesting part is why. So Justice Kennedy, for the majority, saw, and I'm quoting here the opinion, little reason to question the legitimate interest of the government in knowing for an absolute certainty, I guess which is a higher level of certainty than certainty, uh, the identity of the person arrested in knowing whether he is wanted elsewhere and in ensuring his identification in the event he flees prosecution. Right? So Kennedy says um, to pursue that interest in identification and knowing the person is who he or she says he is, courts have confirmed that the Fourth Amendment allows police to take certain routine administrative steps incident to arrest, bookkeeping, photographing, fingerprinting, uh, and that DNA identification is merely an extension of these traditionally lawful methods, methods of identification long used in dealing with persons who are under arrest. And so in the balance of reasonableness that the court says the Fourth Amendment requires, uh, the court gives great weight both the significant governmental interest at stake uh, in the identification of arrestees as well as to the unmatched potential of DNA identification to serve uh, to vindicate that interest. Uh, the court also deemed minimal uh, the intrusion, intrusion on legitimate expectations uh, of privacy. It's merely a cheek swab, right? It's over almost before uh, it starts uh, to obtain a DNA sample from uh, someone arrested for a serious offense. Well, Justice Scalia writes the dissenting opinion, uh, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan, and Scalia was having none of it. Uh, he was in, you could say, rare form or typical <laughs> form. Uh, it was uh, a vehement dissent, um, and if you want to see what, um, what it would look like, you know, I don't know if you were a kid and you played um, Little League and or soccer and there was a mercy rule, right, if one side was winning 25 to nothing at a certain point, they just stopped the game, right? Um, if, if legal arguments actually, all right, um, were, if you view a scoring, right, this fight, um, they would have stopped it. Um, but nonetheless, um, Kennedy has what Scalia doesn't, which is five, uh, five votes. <laughs> so uh, Scalia says, look, the Fourth Amendment forbids searching a person for evidence of a crime when there is no basis for believing the person's guilty of the crime or possesses incriminating evidence. So when the police arrested Alonzo King, Right, there was nothing suggesting uh, any kind of suspicion that he was somehow implicated in this 2003 rape right, that took place elsewhere. Scalia said this prohibition is categorical and without exception. It lies at the very heart of the Fourth Amendment. Whenever this court has allowed a suspicionless search, which is what's going on here, it's a suspicionless search, because again, they're searching for evidence of the rape, right, not the crime for which he's arrested. It has insisted upon a justifying motive apart from the investigation of crime. And then uh, Scalia uh, launches into a tirade. The court's assertion that DNA is being taken not to solve crimes, but to identify those in the state's custody taxes the credulity of the credulous. Uh, DNA testing, and what he says, as far as I know, is all true. You can tell me if he's wrong. DNA testing does not even begin until after arraignment and bail decisions are already made. The samples sat in storage for months and take weeks to test. When they are tested, they are checked against the unsolved crimes collection rather than the convict and arrestee collection, which could be used to identify them. The Maryland statute forbids the court's purpose of identification, but prescribes as its purpose what our suspicionless search cases forbid, official investigation into a crime. Against all of that, it is safe to say that if the court's identification theory is not wrong, there is no such thing as error. Now, Justice Kennedy does not have a habit of responding at all to dissenting opinions, right? And he doesn't engage here. Um, I don't see any way in which Justice Scalia is wrong about what is going on here. If you're taking the swab and matching it against unsolved crimes, there's no way a match is going to tell you the identification of the person. It's because you know who the person is that you're trying to solve the unsolved crime. Right? And so um, you could either sit back and laugh, or you could just you know, have your blood pressure raised to the point where you, know, you worry if Justice Scalia is going to be OK. Um, he says, solving unsolved crimes is a noble objective, but it occupies a lower place in the American pantheon of noble objectives and the protection of our people from suspicionless law enforcement searches. The Fourth Amendment must prevail. He also says that the logic of this opinion is not limited to serious crimes. Right? What is it about a serious offense as opposed to a minor offense? 
um, that, that makes any difference here. Uh, he says it could be a, tra a minor traffic offense. No matter how unjustified the arrest, no matter how innocent the person, right, government now may be able to do this. And this has implications around the country. All 50 states require DNA collection from felony convicts. 28 states and the federal government have passed laws similar to Maryland's by authorizing the collection of DNA for some or all arrestees. Uh, it's now going to be easier for states and the federal government to solve unsolved crimes, including brutal crimes, including right, rapes and murders. But it's also going to be easier for governments to take DNA samples from innocent people or possibly right, from people who have committed minor uh, offenses. Interestingly, I was at the, the National Convention of the American Constitution Society, I guess it was in June, and Justice Stevens was the keynote speaker. And he agreed entirely with Justice Scalia's analysis, but disagreed with his conclusion. So he would have sided with the majority, but on more reality-based grounds. Right? He thinks the challenge of the case is to justify taking DNA swabs because of the interest in solving unsolved crimes, because of the minimal intrusion and privacy, but writing an opinion in a way that doesn't say that night is day and day is night, that this is being used for identification purposes as opposed to uh, the actual purpose animating the statute. So this is all to say that um, you, may you may agree with Justice Scalia's analysis, right, that he just uh, destroys the majority opinion. You may wonder how Justice Kennedy can write such things. Does he not think other people are going to read it? Right? What about the rest of the majority? They all signed on to this. Right? Um, do, uh, you know, if you did this on an exam, it would not work out well. Um, and yet they get to do it. Uh, I do think the challenge is um, whether or not the majority might be right, but for very different reasons. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to uh, Professor Buell. OK. <clears throat> Can we get Chipotle next time, Neil? Uh, I have. I know people, so yes. <laughs> you know, I was thinking as I was sitting here that this, I've done this a few years in a row now, that um, actually you're undermining my teaching because uh, I feel like the message of this thing is we read the cases so you don't have to. Um, and that obviously is the opposite of my message in the classroom. Nonetheless, I read a couple of sentencing cases, so you don't have to. Um, so I, I always find, I, although I don't teach criminal procedure, I haven't um, at this law school, I, I always find it interesting to stop and think a little bit about the, the Supreme Court and criminal procedure, because I always find it so surprising um, in relation to some other areas of what the court does. You know, the late Rehnquist Court and the Roberts Court, I think, have produced a surprisingly complex body of criminal procedure law, um, or, or perhaps diverse would be the better word, um, uh, according to what, you know, what amendment you're in. Uh, relative to the story that of criminal procedure that you know proceeded in the in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and that story continues to unfold in in complex ways. And I think one way of perhaps overgeneralizing is that the this court is much more interested in regulating prosecutors, uh, judges, and legislators than it is in regulating the police. So we have this kind of retrenchment of constitutional regulation of uh, law enforcement but in some ways an expansion of regulation of the uh, judicial process. But again, it's a complex story because in some areas they're not interested in uh, expansion of uh, regulating the judicial process. Sentencing is one area, though, where they have been quite interested in that. So uh, 15 terms ago, the Supreme Court started a project of constitutional regulation of sentencing. It's not that sentencing had never come before the court as a constitutional question before. It's just that, that it had been sort of knocked aside in a few decisions that essentially said the Constitution doesn't have a whole lot to say about this. Um, and that the court uh, you know, reversed on that by basically putting uh, together two ideas. I mean, these are really Sixth Amendment decisions, but you have to have two ideas in mind. One is that the Due Process Clause guarantees uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt of every element of the offense. That's nothing new. That's been around for a long time. Uh, that goes back to uh, the common law origins of, of U.S. criminal law. So we have that guarantee, and then we have the Sixth Amendment guarantee to a uh, to, uh, of a jury trial. So it's not just proof beyond a reasonable doubt of every element of the crime. It's proof to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt of every element of any crime that is a felony that is more than a year, uh, potential of more than a year imprisonment. Um, so this, putting these two together, you know, what's the question that, that is raised? The question is, what's an element, right? What counts as an element of an offense? So 
robbery in the way you normally would, would learn it in first year criminal law is defined as something like taking the property of another or theft by force or threat of force, right? Those are the elements of robbery with some mens rea in, involved. But robberies, as Justice Breyer has frequently pointed out in using this example in these uh, decisions, robberies come in a lot of different flavors. Uh, some robberies involve guns, some don't. Some gun robberies, the gun gets used in a more menacing way than in others. What do we do about those, those kinds of facts or those elements of a crime? In, in the old days, we said, no, those are sentencing factors. Those are just facts that judges can take into account in deciding how much the punishment should be, and therefore there's no right to pr have proven to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that you used a gun in the robbery or that the gun was uh, uh, displayed or, or anything of that nature. Um, now uh, the rule as a result of this 15 years of cases is no. Uh, if, in fact, the use of the gun in a robbery enhances your sentence in some way under the existing legal regime that governs sentencing in the jurisdiction, then you have a right to have that tried to a jury under the Sixth Amendment and proved beyond a reasonable doubt under the Due Process Clause. Um, if it's not required, however, if it's just something that a judge can kind of take into account and maybe rely on, maybe not, when saying why that judge is sentencing the defendant to a particular term of imprisonment, then uh, the Sixth Amendment and the Due Process Clause has nothing to say about that, and it's not an element of, of the offense. So uh, m this is both a result of the sentencing reform movement and because of the sentencing reform movement has produced a lot of case law because the sentencing reform movement in this country, which got started in the 70s and picked up steam in the 80s and 90s, was essentially a process of trying to cabin judicial discretion by identifying sentencing factors, things that used to be called sentencing factors, and assigning to them through various statutory and guideline schemes uh, numbers. If the gun is used, add two years, etc. If the drugs are you know, over a kilo, it's uh, 10 years. If it's less than a kilo, it's five years, you know, that kind of thing. Um, legislation has produced uh, much of this as a result of a sentencing reform movement that was driven by the idea of making sentencing more equal, more fair, uh, more rigorous, more uh, quantitative. And so as a result, we've got lots of, uh, you know, in part the court was responding to that sentencing reform movement and then in responding to it, it's now because criminal sentencing has been so uh, dominated by guideline system and sentencing reforms over the last 20, 30 years, the court has created for itself a huge body of issues and cases that it has to deal with. So every term, essentially, for the last 15 years, we've gotten you know, one or more of these cases. Um, and this, this term, uh, there were two principally that I want to talk about, a case called Alin versus United States and a case called Pew versus United States. So um, the court had previously decided, among other things in this line of cases, that uh, Elements, that is, things that have to be proved to the jury beyond a reasonable doubt, include any fact that increases the statutory maximum for an offense. So if the law says, you know, the penalty of robbery is 0 to 10 years, but if you use a gun, it's 0 to 20, the use of the gun as an element has to be proved to the jury. Um, subsequent to that, the court said, well, gee, uh, that rule should also apply to sentencing guidelines, not just uh, penalties that are set forth in statutes, because if guidelines operate really more or less just like statutes, judges have to follow them, then they're no different than statutes. And if a guideline says that a particular fact, like use of a gun, should increase the sentence, then that's also an element that has to be proved to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and the consequence of all of this, through a very complicated story involving a case called United States versus Booker that some of you know and I won't bore you with today, was uh, a finding that the uh, United States sentencing guidelines, the guidelines that apply to sentencing in federal uh, criminal cases, were no longer binding, that they were simply advisory. Judges, pursuant to the statute that governs procedure around federal sentencing, have to look at them, have to consult them, have to think about them, but don't have to follow them. Um, and as long as they're uh, not binding, they don't mandate these enhancements, then the things that they talk about, the factors that are in them, are not elements. They don't have to be proven to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, so the case that came along, uh, principally this term, is this case called Alin versus United States, which raises the question, what if a fact, a sentencing fact, increases the statutory minimum, not the statutory maximum? Is that a, a fact that has to be proved to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt? And the uh, statute that was involved uh, here was a statute that said uh, 
if you use or carry a firearm in relation to a crime of violence, uh, there is an additional penalty that will apply on top of your crime of violence penalty of at least five years up to life. If you brandish the firearm, and I love that word because I don't really know what that means. I mean, is it brandishing is more than carrying, it's presumably more than displaying, it's, I don't know, showing it and waving it around or something. Um, then the, the brandishing makes it uh, so that your additional penalty has to be seven years to life. So it raises the minimum from the firearm offense. The brandishing raises the minimum from five to seven years. Okay, so is that is brandishing an element of the crime that has to be proved to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt, or is it something the judge can find at sentencing? Um, in a case called Harris versus United States, which was decided in 2002, just a couple of years after the Supreme Court started this project under the Sixth Amendment, the court said no. Uh, raising the minimum isn't uh, really changing the penalty, it's just adjusting the starting point within the pre-existing statutory range. So if the range was five to life for having the firearm, and the statute says, yeah, but if it's brandishing, it's seven to life, you're still within five to life range, so it didn't change anything. Uh, and in Harris versus United States, the court said no, um, mandatory minimums, essentially, are not subject to this, uh, this Sixth Amendment regime. So uh, Alin, the, the defendant Alin was a guy who robbed a person who was trying to go to the bank with some, a store owner was trying to go to the bank with some deposits and, uh, and uh, brandished a firearm. We don't know what that means because they didn't tell us what he actually did with it, but he did something that a judge thought was brandishing. And the jury found that in, uh, in the trial, it was, it was that charge of using the gun was put before the jury and they found, yes, he did use the gun, but they did not decide the issue of whether or not it was brandished. And the judge said at, at sentencing, yeah, it was brandished, so it's seven years instead of five. Harris was actually the exact same statute on virtually the exact same facts. The court takes this case again, this last term, and uh, it reverses the court. It reverses course. Uh, brandishing is an element in an opinion by Justice Thomas that has to be proved to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt, and Harris, which was, again, same statute, same facts, was wrongly decided. Um, now, most people thought analytically that Harris was kind of a dead tree in the sentencing forest that was just waiting to fall down. I mean, there was really no good analytical uh, 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 argument left under the court sentencing decisions that Harris was rightly decided. Um, really, Harris was just, you know, a decision that was, that was reached early in this story at a point at which Justice Breyer was not willing to accept his defeat in this whole line of Sixth Amendment jurisprudence yet. And he sort of provided the fifth vote in Harris, even though he basically admitted that it was inconsistent with the Sixth Amendment theory. But his point was, look, I, I think the Sixth Amendment theory is bogus, and it may not, might not last. So I'm not joining any of these decisions yet. Um, so that's, that's, that, that's how we got Harris. And you know, analytically, there wasn't a good argument to distinguish the mandatory minimum issue from the guidelines issue. And so, I mean, obviously, this increases the potential penalty. So it was just a matter of time, really, before the court um, decided that Harris was wrongly decided. And this was just one of these very unusual, I guess, pretty unusual cases where the court uh, you know, explicitly overrules a prior fairly recent decision and says, look, this is just stare decisis gives way here. I mean, as you probably know, it's much more common for the court to kind of reason its way around a prior decision and curtail it through reasoning than it is to outright say, we're just going to change the law. Um, and there was a nice little interesting sort of as there always is when the court does this, a little side fight about the rules of stare decisis. And uh, Justice Alito, in this case, was the one who was screaming and yelling about stare decisis and, and basically saying, um, I don't like this whole Sixth Amendment line of cases either. I think they were wrong. And if we can overrule Harris, then we can overrule the whole line of cases. And if we ever get a chance to do that, I'm citing this case as the authority for being able to do that, um, was essentially the dissent in the case. Uh, so, so that's a Lynn versus United States, which I think sort of, you know, in the grand scheme stands for the proposition that the court is just continuing on this march of bringing the Sixth Amendment into sentencing. There's no sign that the court is prepared to uh, turn back on this. Justice O'Connor, who was an opponent of this line of cases, has left the court. Uh, uh, Justice Sotomayor, who Nobody really knew what she was going to do on this, has come on the court and become one of the prime advocates of this line of cases. She's writing a number of the opinions, so I don't think this is going anywhere. Now, Pew versus United States 
is interesting because, one, it's not a case about the Sixth Amendment. It's a case about the ex post facto clause. But it relates very much to the sentencing issue and in some ways exposes the analytical weakness of this whole Sixth Amendment line of sentencing cases. So the uh, Constitution, you know, Article 1, Section 9, says no, no ex post facto law shall be passed. And in a case called Calder versus Bull, which is one of the first you know, decisions of the Supreme Court, uh, the court uh, said that what this means is that, um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the words of Calder versus Bull, if a, a law inflicts a greater punishment than the law annexed to the crime when the crime was committed, it's a violation of the ex post facto clause. So increasing the punishment for a crime uh, is just as bad under the Constitution as changing what is a crime and then prosecuting somebody for it for something that happened before the law was changed, right? So if we prosecute somebody for something they did before we increase the punishment for a crime, that's a violation of, uh, you know, pursuant to the increased punishment, that's a violation of the ex post facto clause. In later decisions, the court said, what does this mean? Well, it means that any change in the law that substantially increases the risk of a higher punishment is a violation of the ex post facto clause. So what about sentencing guidelines, which are getting changed all the time? Every year, the US Sentencing Commission updates these things, and often they get increased. Um, sometimes because Congress says to do so, like in the early 2000s when there was a lot of concern about white collar crime, and Congress said, hey, Sentencing Commission, take a look at the fraud guidelines. They might not be severe enough. And the Sentencing Commission said, yeah, we took a look at them, and they're not severe enough. And they made them much more severe. So Pew is a defendant who committed, uh, believe it or not, a, a sort of garden variety bank fraud in 1998 and was not sentenced until 2010. In 1998, the guidelines would have called for about half the punishment in his case that they called for under the 2010 version because of the increase in, in, in punishment for white collar crimes. Um, the court said using the 2010 guidelines in Pew's case is a violation of the ex post facto clause because the guidelines, the increase in the guidelines substantially increased the risk that Pew would get a higher punishment. And the reason it substantially increased the risk of a higher punishment for him is that the court, under the procedural sentencing statute, has to start with and consult the sentencing guidelines when it's deciding what, what, what punishment to impose. Now, the dissent, which was a Thomas dissent, um, wasn't quite in the tone of a Scalia dissent, but it was a similar uh, uh, kind of situation to the one that uh, Professor Siegel talked about. So the dissent basically said, you've got to be kidding me. The whole point of this Sixth Amendment line of cases was to say that if we're going to have sentencing guidelines, they can't be binding. And in fact, the federal sentencing guidelines we declare, said the Supreme Court in a case called Booker that I mentioned a minute ago, are not binding. Otherwise, they'd be unconstitutional under the Sixth Amendment. We can't require judges to make findings of fact at sentencing and that increase penalties. That's a violation of the Due Process Clause in the Sixth Amendment. Um, so uh, how is it exactly that changing the guidelines after Pew's crime and then consulting them in connection with his sentence is an ex post facto violation. How is it that, that changing something that's essentially not binding law is a violation of the ex post facto clause because it changes the punishment for a crime? How is it the guidelines are unconstitutional if they in fact bindingly change the punishment for crimes, uh, uh, but, but they're, um, you know, so they're, therefore they're not binding if we're going to have them, but then non-binding guidelines can be a violation of the ex post facto clause. So I think this case exposes the analytical weakness of the Apprendi or Sixth Amendment line of cases, which decided that the cure for the violation of a right to the jury trial and having uh, binding guidelines is either to make them actual elements of the crime that have to be proved to a jury at trial or to give the judge the power to choose whether to apply them or not. And if the judge has the discretion to decide whether or not to apply the guidelines, uh, then uh, they're not unconstitutional, even if that discretion is subject to a strong enough lean in fa favor of applying them that it's an ex post facto violation to use them when they've gone up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Buell. Uh, Professor Coleman's also going to talk about a different right protected under the Sixth Amendment. Well, sort of a right. Um, <laughs> used to be protected. <laughs> used to be a right. Um, you know what happens at the end of a football game when the team that has the ball has about three seconds left, 60 yards to go for a touchdown, and four points behind, right? Quarterback throws a Hail Mary pass. Um, 
And that's sort of what ineffective assistance of counsel claims are. Uh, <laughs> they are they are claims that are often raised in cases where the uh, the the petitioner has other claims, but they're probably procedurally barred or you know aren't very good. And so you throw in a um, ineffective assistance of counsel claim. I, you see them all the time. They are rarely successful, uh, and, and, and that's why they, they're, in effect, the constitutional equivalent of a Hail Mary pass. Um, the, the court decided a case uh, in February. Uh, is it Chattis? Jadis Chattis? I, I could tell you what I've been saying, but I have what have you been to saying? think I'm right. I would have been saying um, Chattis. OK, Chattis. We'll call it that. Uh, <laughs> Somebody recently wrote a law review article about how to pronounce Supreme Court case. Right. Yeah. Well, so there, there are two. So uh, uh, Padilla, which was decided in 2010, uh, is a an immigration. Uh, well, it's an ineffective assistance to counsel case uh, in the immigration context, and the issue that the court decided was that uh, that uh, if a uh, if a petitioner can show prejudice, that is, that he was prejudiced by the lawyer's error in a case, uh, then you, you, you could make out a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel where the lawyer failed to advise the uh, client of the immigration consequences of a guilty plea. And this arises in the context uh, both of changes in the immigration laws which make some criminal violations an automatic uh, ground for deportation or removal, um, and the aggressive way in which the Obama administration has been enforcing uh, those laws. Uh, both of these cases, uh, the earlier case in 2010, involved an uh, individual who was a lawful permanent resident, had been in the United States for more than uh, 40 years, I uh, and uh, was busted uh, for uh, trafficking, trafficking in uh, marijuana. Basically, he was, uh, caught with a truckload of uh, marijuana. I uh, he pled guilty. Uh, his lawyer uh, affirmatively advised him that uh, it would not have any immigration consequences because he had been in the country for so long. I uh, and. Uh, conversely failed to advise him that that wasn't true <laughs> and that in fact uh, if he pled guilty it would be automatic uh, deportation or at least he would be subject to automatic deportation. Uh, the court held that uh, it was the Strickland versus Washington which is the Supreme Court decision governing ineffective assistance of counsel has two prongs one is that you have to show that the lawyer's conduct was below the standard of lawyers in the community. Uh, and then second, uh, you have to show that, uh, that there was prejudice, which, which means that but for the lawyer's error, uh, the, uh, the result of the criminal proceeding uh, would have been different. Uh, so usually what happens in these cases is that the court finds that there's no prejudice. So they don't really even deal with the question whether the lawyer's conduct uh, was below the standard. They say that the defendant or the petitioner in this case can't show prejudice. What they did in, the, uh, uh, in 2010, though, was to say that the failure to advise a defendant that to plead guilty uh, to uh, the particular crime to which he pled guilty uh, would result in, would subject him to automatic deportation was below the standard of what a criminal defense lawyer would do in Kentucky. Uh, therefore, uh, that uh, uh, presented a, um, a situation in which ineffective assistance of counsel might be present uh, if, the, uh, if, if the petitioner could then show that he was prejudiced. And, and what that would involve is to, uh, is to uh, withdraw his plea, try to renegotiate a better plea, 
uh, uh, to a charge that would not result in automatic uh, de uh, removal or to go to trial and hope that he was either convicted of a crime that would not result in automatic removal or that he was acquitted. Uh, so that was, you know, so basically you get a second chance to try to improve your criminal situation. Um, and if you're able to do so, then, um, you know, uh, if you can show that you, were, you would have been able to do that, then you would show prejudice and therefore you would be entitled to relief. Uh, the, the only issue that the court decided in Chattis was whether the 2010 decision would be retroactive. That is, would it apply to uh, plea agreements that uh, occurred before March 2010? And the court held that, I, I, that it would not be retroactive, that its 2010 decision was a new rule meaning that it was not dictated by Strickland and any precedent of the Supreme Court applying Strickland, uh, but that it was something that was a break with, uh, with, with what, was, what Strickland was commonly understood to mean. Uh, and it based this on the distinction between whether a consequence of a plea agreement was a direct consequence or a collateral consequence. And what the court held was that before it decided the case in 2010, I, courts recognized that distinction and that uh, ineffective assistance of counsel applied only where a lawyer failed to advise a client of a direct consequence. Uh, and they decided in 2010 that in some cases uh, it would also apply when the lawyer fails to uh, advise of uh, an indirect consequence such as uh, automatic deportation. Um, what, by, by describing this as a new rule under a case called Teague versus Lane, uh, what, what, what the court did in effect was to find that a lawyer could commit malpractice, uh, or at least it, it was recognized that a lawyer could commit malpractice uh, but still be effective under the Sixth Amendment. Uh, that, in effect, was uh, what some of the decisions held because the court recognized that as far as long ago as 1968, the American Bar Association advised criminal defense lawyers to uh, advise their clients of the deportation consequences of uh, plea agreements. So um, that's, uh, that, that's sort of where we are. I don't, I don't think it really changes anything. It, 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 it takes away a Hail Mary for people who are facing deportation as a result of uh, guilty pleas before March uh, 2010. But my guess is that in a lot of those cases, the person would not be able to show prejudice anyway, and so probably not much of a consequence. OK, thank you very much, Professor Coleman. So we still have. Uh uh, by my count, 12 minutes. So I'm um, eager to hear your questions about anything you've heard or any other cases that are on your mind. Questions, anyone? Yes. Yeah, so this is not actually the most interesting question, but I was just wondering about the King case. Like, what would have happened if the court had said, no, it wasn't OK to collect that evidence, but the they would know that he had done the rape. Like, is there anything they could have done to convict him? That's an interesting question. Uh, would they, are they, is there other, right? I mean, I guess it would, would it they, turn well, if they weren't there permitted to take the swab, then there would have to be, a, they, they wouldn't be able to use right. that. But if, if the, what they found, so they're, if what they found from the follow-up investigation could be sufficiently dissociated from the swab that they unconstitutionally obtained, then they might still be able to bring a prosecution, but they would have to have a sort of separate category of evidence, and there would have to be a claim by law enforcement that they were on their way down that road anyway, despite the swab. So if they would never have looked at the guy except for the swab, then they lose all the evidence they find as a result? It would, it would be fruits, yeah. There's Fourth Amendment fruits. Yeah. But, but the way you describe it, it sounds like if they're, right, uh, if they're sort of fair and balanced about it, then there's no way they can prosecute him. And they'd have to play games in order to do that, or the court would have to accept it. Because if they had no clue that this guy had any involvement, how, 
Right. Well, the problem is that law enforcement always has the only perfect information about what law enforcement was about to do. So usually law enforcement can make a claim and courts will often accept it at face value that they had additional information and the suspect was already in the crosshairs. But this is one of those rare cases where I actually think you could barely make that argument with a straight face. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it might have real consequences for whether or not there's a prosecution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I... I'm interested, um, Professor Coleman, your thoughts on the DNA case, right? Because this is something that's right, very real to you and, and what you do day to day uh, with students. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agreed with uh, Scalia. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think on, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's the way you, you solve a lot of, you know, unsolved cases, uh, you know, major cases. Uh, on the other hand, though, taking it from a uh, suspect, uh, you know, in the course of an investigation of one crime and then sort of using it to sort of see if he's done anything else, I, it seems to me to be unfair. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, my guess is that law enforcement uh, officials, uh, I know this will shock you, but uh, will we'll probably try to find some rationale for why they were on to this guy anyway for the other crime and sure. that... Uh, the uh, the DNA was in, in effect harmless air, uh, violating the Fourth Amendment was harmless air with the with the DNA. Uh, what about taking a DNA swab from everyone in America? Yeah, you know, that's what I mean. That's that's sort of uh, it's sort of where would you draw the line, right? Right. So if you were required to give a DNA sample, uh, you know, as a consequence of getting a driver's license. Uh, and then you could basically run the samples uh, against unsolved crimes and probably solve a lot of crimes that way. Mm -hmm. So we, we were actually, uh, Jim and I were at a conference at UVA the day this decision came down, and Brandon Garrett was mm -hmm. with us, who's you know, one of the leading experts in the legal academy on both DNA evidence and wrongful convictions. And uh, you know, he, his reaction was, look, um, you know, there's sort of this view that like, the more, you know, the DNA is pretty factual, right? So the more facts, the better. How can that hurt anybody, you know? But the problem is that, as a practical matter, uh, the system is incapable of handling the volume it already has. You know, DNA testing is, is expensive, it's slow, uh, the labs are not adequately funded and staffed. So uh, in some sense, throwing a bunch more DNA into the system is just going to make it harder to get what you need in the cases where you have some reason to already be focusing on the issue. Mm -hmm. and, and that probably will be the restraint also on, the, uh, on, on law enforcement, is that it, they, they won't be able to afford to do it. So, you know, they would do it only in those cases where they think the person is a particularly bad person and that uh, he or she might be responsible for some other crimes that are unsolved. I think that would be the situation in which they would actually do the testing as opposed to just randomly testing, uh, you know, all the DNA that they have in their, in their data bank. Mm -hmm. other, uh, other questions? Uh, yes. Um, Professor Griffin, about the, the dog sniffing case. Mm -hmm. um, so if the court rules that there is this reasonable expectation of privacy um, for odors wafting out, is there a boundary for that? I mean, they well, said the, well, the court didn't rule that. So the decision was based, the, major, the opinion for the court is based on the trespass rationale. Um, so it's similar in some ways structurally to the GPS case um, and the Jones rationale, where Justice Scalia says this would have been a trespass, and because it's a trespass, we're going to call it a search and a violation of the Fourth Amendment, or rather something that implicates the Fourth Amendment. And then separately, three justices said, by the way, we think that there is also a reasonable expectation of privacy in not having dogs sniff at your front door. This is Assuming that they had five votes. Right. This theory is out there. Um, do they mention all like a boundary about that, where uh, you know maybe the dog can't approach, but your dog is is on this you know the public street? I mean, the only reason I ask this because in my hometown this past summer we had a big incident where a landfill turns out was accepting something that it shouldn't have and produced a raw egg smell that completely covered the town, and that kind of clued people in saying there's something wrong going on. Here. Didn't really need a dog for that one. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that, that seems something where. If, 
know, they say you have this reasonable expectation of privacy, maybe over smells that originate in your in your property? It's definitely confined to the home. The court has already decided, and, and many people thought that the decision would be controlled by earlier decisions. Dogs can sniff at your luggage in airports. Dogs can sniff at cars and car stops. Those, those issues have long been banked. Um, and I think we're probably done with dogs now at the court because we've, we've, been, we've looked at it in almost every scenario. But interestingly, you know, ultimately, there were enough votes to draw a line at the home. Um, and you can you know, pick which theory you think is more persuasive, but either on a property rights theory or or based on a reasonable expectation of privacy, it is treated differently when a dog approaches your front door than when a dog approaches your car or your luggage at the airport or the garbage dump or any public space. Yes. Um, in the DNA case, um, in Scalia's dissent, he says, I thought you the quote him was saying that generally for suspicionless searches, you need probable cause to find that particular evidence. But I thought the court in searches incident to arrest has been pretty lenient in allowing searches incident to arrest without any probable cause for the particular evidence. For example, if you're arrested for an assault and they find drugs, they generally uphold the drugs, even if there's no reason to search that particular container or your particular wallet or pocket or whatever. Is that right, true? Or? Right, but it's, it's the search incident to arrest what's the crime for which you were arrested, as opposed to the DNA swab, which is what other crime right around the country you might have otherwise committed. Right, so I don't think it's a, I mean, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think if it's a previous jurisprudence Right, um, uh, you could just invoke that as authority for what they were doing here. That's what I think makes this a different, a different question. Right, wouldn't the issue be that with the search incident to arrest, yeah, you find something you had no reason to think you were looking for, but the reason you were doing the search was because of what the search incident to arrest doctrine allows you to do, whereas the DNA swab, there's no argument that that needs to be done for any reason whatsoever other than the investigation of a crime that has nothing to do with the one you're arrested for, right? It's not because you're going to get contraband or weapons out of the cheek swab, in the, right. um, which is really what justifies the, the sort of in extremis encounter that any arrest involves is the justification for that doctrine, and law enforcement can look for contraband and weapons, but I don't see any reason why you would connect that back to taking a swab of someone's, the inside of someone's cheek. Yes. Again, with the DNA case, is there no similar concern for fingerprints? It seems like there isn't any sort of outcry that's been long accepted as identification, but couldn't you do the same thing with fingerprints? Right, and that's the argument on the other side, is that um, right, fingerprinting is also used not just for identification purposes, but also to solve crimes. Um, and, you know, I think the response has to be that fingerprinting is primarily used and has long been used for identification purposes and not just to solve unsolved crimes. Um, is that, I mean, that's... So if we started saying we're going to take everyone's DNA instead of their fingerprints <laughs> for identification purposes... Right. Well, that's. Right. I, I think that's right. That that would lend some force to Kennedy's argument. Right. right. That would lend. Yeah. That would. But I mean. I mean. Do you. Do you see any difference between fingerprinting and, and identification? Fingerprinting isn't very telling or accurate. About who someone is. <laughs> um, it's just it's substantially less. Yeah. About either who someone is or who committed a crime. It's just DNA is just a much higher. Although I will say it is working on the new iPhone 5s. <laughs> but is, is fingerprinting used uh, as a booking procedure primarily to solve unsolved crimes or primarily for identification? For purposes? ID. For ID. I think, okay. I think mm -hmm. that's right. I mean, that's, yeah. I Tim mean, would know better about it. Talking to Erwin Chemerinsky no, about this, that's, that's how he would have distinguished it. It's primarily for ID, even if yeah. it's not all that good. It's not primarily. It seems to me that's, that's, what, that's what the response has to be, right, in order to refute the claim that the court has already right, um, decided this issue, already passed this. They've already committed themselves to saying one thing and doing something else. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, um, a lot of pressure. Um, if you were to extend the, that DNA gathering principle to lesser crimes, like misdemeanors, for example, do you think it would actually matter what the logic behind getting the, the agreement is? You know, would it matter whether the person um, has DNA collected as a matter of course versus signing some agreement when they make a plea agreement or whether they're arrested that says that they consent to have their DNA taken? Does that make a difference? Well, I think consent yeah. would make all this, right? <laughs> if there's actual consent, if I, you know, if I, I could consent right now, right, then, it, then I think that would, right, take away the entire Fourth Amendment problem. It's really um, that these statutes require it. Um, and once you require it and take off consent, um, you know, you can consent to have the police bring 10 dogs inside your house, let alone the front porch. We're not talking about the Fourth Amendment, right? We're just talking about probably some poop. Um, 
you know, um, <laughs> but once you're not consenting, then, you know, the, I don't see what principal distinction there is between a serious crime and a minor offense unless you think that if you're arrested for a serious crime by virtue of having done that, you're somehow sufficiently more likely to have committed some other serious crime? Well, I think that would be the argument. I mean, that's, that's the assumption, is that if you committed other crimes, it probably was a serious crime. Right, although many people who are, who are, who are arrested for committing minor crimes, you say minor, people commit serious crimes and minor crimes. Yeah. So you're more likely to commit... I, I, don't think, I, don't think that, I don't think it matters. I mean, I don't think the distinction... It hasn't historically mattered in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. There isn't a sliding scale based right. on how serious the offense is that, practically speaking, oftentimes the court accounts for the facts and there seems to be one, but there, there really isn't better, right. more Fourth Amendment protections for lesser criminal. There's no such thing. Right, so, the, so this is one of the... This, you see this all the time in all areas of... Supreme Court jurisprudence, where the court, there are facts here that make it seem more reassuring. This is just limited to people arrested for serious crimes. But in fact, if there's no principal basis for distinction, serious and less serious, what except the court say so is going right, to restrain the taking of DNA swabs to serious uh, people arrested, not even convicted of serious crimes? Uh, what if you start seeing evidence that states require it uh, for minor Offense, minor offenses, and it actually starts bearing fruit. Right, you start getting people, right, uh, you know, um, uh, who are guilty, right, who are guilty of very serious, serious crimes. All right, well, let's stop there. I want to thank my colleagues and uh, thank all of you as well. Right. Yeah.